It's been almost a year since the Google Pixel made me put down my iPhone and transformed me from a Google Apps user on Apple hardware to a pure Google acolyte. In the grand hug of war between mobile religions, I'm now pulled in the direction of Android, and I can't express much regret about it. But Apple has just made official its biggest redesign and rethink of the iPhone ever, and so I was definitely curious about the iPhone X and the future it paints for the Apple ecosystem. As it turns out, though, the iPhone X really isn't a phone designed to draw me back in, it's more customer service to existing iPhone users than an appeal to new ones. The Android user hat isn't the only one I wear, but here are my main iPhone X takeaways from the perspective of someone deeply immersed in the Android realm. A radical iPhone redesign is a good thing for everyone, no matter what it looks like or who buys it. I think this is an important point that's all too often disregarded. Any sufficiently ambitious company should dread the stagnation of its competitors, which is liable to lead to complacency and a slowdown in progress. When the United States put people on the moon in the 1960s, those efforts were spurred by the threat of the Soviet Union making it there first. Having a strong rival is essential to keeping up the pace of innovation. Google and its myriad Android hardware partners have always had that an Apple's iPhone, and this major redesign will give them a fresh and different antagonist to measure up against. The new iPhone X hardware design doesn't thrill me at all. I know this part is subjective, but having seen the Galaxy S8 and Note 8, the Essential Phone and the LG V30, I am no longer wowed by, almost, bezel-less screens. I've now used multiple devices like that and, in all honesty, the absentee bezels are something I forget about very quickly. I don't feel like I'm using a radically new and different design, and though it's a little awkward to return to a phone with old school bezels like the HTC U11, I've recently done it and survived the supposed regression. What I don't fancy about the iPhone's new look is the extra glossy glass back, punctuated by a chunky, protruding dual camera module, it's supposed to be ultra minimalist, yet it has this big eyesore on it. And the same is true of the front, where the top notch makes for a good brand identifier but a questionable design choice. The under the hood upgrades that Apple announced are likely to be significant, including the first GPU designed by Apple itself and a battery life that's supposedly two hours longer than that of the iPhone 7. The cameras are said to have physically larger sensors too, which may help the iPhone catch up to the rapidly advancing Android competition in the camera phone race. But does any of that excite my gadget lust or make me wonder whether Apple's photos could be as good as Google Photos? No, not yet. The iPhone 7 of last year had one of the most powerful processors ever put inside a mobile device, but I can't think of a single occasion where I was using an Android phone and wishing I had the extra power of the iPhone. Apple's embrace of key wireless charging on both the iPhone 8 and iPhone X will not only be significant, it might be the final piece required to make wireless charging a truly mainstream feature. Even if you never buy an iPhone, you should be glad that Apple and Samsung, the two most prolific smartphone makers, have both chosen the same standard. At present, I get a kick out of charging the LG V30 on Samsung's wireless charging dock. But in the future this sort of cross-compatibility and universality will stretch across both iOS and Android. That's great news for all, and it lays the foundation for one day having a smartphone that has no ports at all, s chewing cables in favor of wireless data, audio, and power transfer. If you like this video please leave a like and subscribe.